Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, the Human Rights Foundation's conversation series where we expose dictators, debate pressing global human rights issues, and brainstorm how we can collectively put human rights on the top of the world agenda. My name is Kenza Buonen, and I'm a legal research associate with HRF. HRF is an international, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and protecting human rights globally, with a focus on countries under authoritarian rule. We unite people in the common cause of promoting liberal democracy. You can visit our website, hrf.org, to learn more about the work we do. Please also to make sure to follow us on Twitter for more conversations like the one we will be having today. Before we begin, I want to inform everyone participating today that this conversation will be recorded to be released as a podcast in the future on Apple, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. We'll have time at the end for questions, but we caution anyone participating today that if you have any security concerns to use anonymity on your account profile. If you'd like to submit a question, please send them to me via DM at Kenza Buonen. Thank you. Today's episode will focus on Afghanistan and the aftermath of the Taliban takeover. In August 2021, the Taliban forcibly reclaimed control of Afghanistan, promising to institute a moderate form of an Islamic government that would align with modern values. Of all the issues which exemplifies the Taliban rule, it is the treatment of the 19 million Afghan women and girls left vulnerable in the wake of foreign military withdrawal. In the last year and change, the regime has strategically and sporadically implemented gender-specific measures against women, in a direct contrast to their initial claims of substantial reform. In the last 20 years, Afghanistan's civil society has made significant strides of progress that have continuously declined under the Taliban's draconian governance of women's rights, a microcosm of a larger theocratic system at play. Breaking down the grip of the Taliban rule, this is an exploratory analysis and discussion with a central pioneer of women's rights in Afghanistan, Dr. Seema Samar. Dr. Samar is an internationally recognized human rights activist born in the Ghazni province of Afghanistan. During Afghanistan's interim government in 2001, she served as the first minister for women's affairs, a newly implemented office that was unprecedented in function. Not only was she one of the five deputy prime ministers appointed at the time of the transition government, but Dr. Samar was also the first woman to hold a political office of that caliber in the country's history. After her term, Seema was designated as the first chairperson of the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. Not the least of her credentials, Dr. Samar is also a trained physician who defied the limitations of her time, becoming the first woman to earn a medical degree, becoming among one of the first women to earn a medical degree from Kabul University. She has previously served as a special envoy of the president of Afghanistan and state minister for human rights and international affairs. Currently, Dr. Samar is a member of the United Nations Secretary General's High-Level Panel on Internal Displacement and High-Level Advisory Board on Mediation. In 2010, Dr. Samar gave a main stage talk at the Oslo Freedom Forum, HRF's flagship human rights conference in Norway. Almost 14 years later, Dr. Samar is still a force to be reckoned with, and her passionate commitment to human rights and freedom has not wavered. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Samar. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. I'm sorry for this uh, technical problem. (laughs) No, no problem. Um, Okay. So, Dr. Samar, you were born in 1957 as a woman and as a Hazara, which is a deeply persecuted ethnic minority group. Based on that alone, it seems that the trajectory of your life, an unfavorable one, was already delineated. And yet, you have built the most remarkable career in human rights and international justice. What compelled you towards human rights advocacy? Uh, First of all, um, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so sorry that it was uh, so problematic. I think first of my my commitment to the um, human rights was one of the reasons that I was uh, really standing with a lot of uh, problems that I had and facing. Uh, and continue to struggle for equality and human rights in the country. Um, and of course, not only in Afghanistan, but also um, everywhere, because I believe that justice everywhere would be justice, uh, justice anywhere would be justice everywhere. 
what was your experience like working as the first Minister of Women's Affairs and what sort of visions did you have for the function of this unprecedented, unprecedented office? Uh, yes, I just want to clarify a few points. One, I was not the only first woman, uh, Hazara woman, to become a medical doctor. Uh, before me, it was more women who were doctor. Yeah. Uh, I, I think for the, uh, as a minister of women's affairs, after the Taliban first regime failed in 2001, uh, I was really trying to... Uh, convince the people to acknowledge the existence of women and to really respect the uh, dignity of women as a human, uh, equal of human being in Afghanistan. So my uh, vision was to create an environment to enable women to uh, make a space for themselves within the society and to be actually to be uh, prove that they are able to do the work that they have to do as, a, as an equal citizen in the country. So it was really a lot of struggle because I have to start it from scratch, first of all, the, uh, to establish the Ministry of Women that day. And secondly, people were thinking, everybody in the cabinet were thinking that anything related to women should be done by the Ministry of Women's mm -hmm. Affairs. Although, yes, the Ministry of Women's Affairs should do a lot of work, but it's not possible to only uh, uh, direct everything related to women to the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Although men and women's issues should be cross-cutting in every ministry, including the Ministry of Defense or Engineer or even the security forces. Women should be part of those. And uh, the women's rights should be cross-cutting in every other social, economic, and political um, environment and structure of the country. Great. Um, in February 2021, it was estimated that approximately 27% of seats in parliament were held by women. And today that number is zero. Can you talk about how the Taliban has restricted by virtue of gender, the freedom of movement, male guardianship, and the ability to work? Yes, um, we actually have in the constitution, the constitution which was uh, approved by the Loya Jirga um, and ratified by the Loya Jirga in 2004, we had 25% of the um, parliament and also the uh, provincial council to be women. So every uh, different provinces that we have in the country should have one. It, it was related to their population, but two women from those provinces. Kabul had much more number. So we had around 27% of the parliament as women uh, in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, everything was, after the collapse of, uh, of the government, everything was abolished. So parliament in general was abolished. So not only from the women were removed from the parliament, they almost removed from all the social sphere of the society. I mean, only women are allowed to work as a, as a medical staff and also to be teacher in the primary schools for the girls. Uh, they're not allowed to do any other work, uh, which we had women everywhere. For example, we had more than 3,000 women as a police woman in the Ministry of Interior. We had more than 1,700 women as army officers and army, and we had women in the the uh, different other sector um, uh, in every ministries we had women uh, in different uh, level and position. We had a uh, woman as a minister, we had women as a deputy ministers. All are gone. Mm -hmm. So now they are trying to use the male uh, member of the family as a tool in order to restrict women's movement and freedom. Mm -hmm. So they, for example, they announced that if women do not cover their faces, the male member of the family would be punished. Mm -hmm. So of course, the male member of the family is trying to uh, restrict the mobility uh, and movement of women not to be punished themselves. So they are trying to create their, um, the patriarchy that we already had in the country, but not in this level, more emboldened and more empowered. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only in Afghanistan, I think it's, it has impact in all the other 
uh, particularly on the other um, fundamentalist Islamic movement mm -hmm. around the world, mm -hmm. uh, and not neighboring countries as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, shifting gears a bit towards your medical expertise, um, you're a trained physician and your career has largely focused on improving the material conditions of women and minorities, particularly in healthcare. Could you please explain um, the intersection of healthcare access and authoritarian regimes? How do poverty and conflict under the regime exacerbate the fragility of the healthcare system, specifically for these vulnerable populations like girls? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, um, I have to say that we um, have achieved a lot after the 2001, uh, mm -hmm. after 2002 practically, on the provision of basic health services, but it was not really covered all over the country. So uh, even before the collapse, we had problems. But after the collapse, the, even though that system which was existing uh, is not existing anymore. One, uh, most of the um, medical staff or medical, medical profession who could, they already left the country. Secondly, uh, because of the poverty and because of the collapse of the, uh, all those social security, social services in the country, uh, and the, the hospitals and the clinics which had some, some resources, they finished. Although now they are trying, the WHO and UN is trying to, to support those uh, sectors, but of course, it's, it's very, very difficult, particularly with the increase of um, poverty. Mm -hmm. They are not able to reach to those, even if there is a clinic existing there, they cannot reach because there is not the proper um, public transportation for the people. And it's, people lost their income, particularly women lost their income. Mm -hmm. And I think the poverty and lack of this uh, accessibility has a very, very negative impact on women's health. Mm -hmm. And if more uh, premature child born, uh, babies born in the country, it's more unwanted pregnancy because they don't have the access to reproductive rights mm -hmm. and contraception. And I think that is a problematic because the uh, population uh, growth is much, much higher than economical growth in the country, which itself is a problem. And we had this problem during, uh, in the last 40 years of war in the country. That's why we have a lot of young men mm -hmm. without education and without job opportunity. And then they are vulnerable to the terrorist and smuggler groups and, and criminal groups to, be, to join in order to live. Mm -hmm. And that has a very negative impact not only in Afghanistan, but also in the region and also in the international um, community, because you could see the number of the young Afghans who try to get out of the country, and they are in Iran, and they are deported they are in, in Turkey, they are report, deported, Turkey is uh, mm -hmm. deporting thousands of Afghans. Mm -hmm. In other countries, I mean, the, uh, the European countries started to deport, but uh, luckily after the uh, Plus, um, and they are they are facing a lot of problems uh, at the refugee camps and in, in the borders. It is a lot of violation of human rights. Uh, a lot of people who lost their life either drowned on the seas and the oceans, or they were killed on the um, on the border between Turkey and Iran and Turkey and Greece. Um, everywhere, I mean, you name it. In the forest, they are killed. In the mountains, they are killed. In the water, they are drowned and killed. Mm -hmm. and died over there, and they and the families don't even know where they are. Mm -hmm. And and it's a, it is a problem, I think. Not only, as I said, not only for Afghanistan, but also for the other countries. Yes. Um, I just want to remind our guests listening that if you have any questions, you can pose them to me via DM at Kenza Boonen, and if there's time at the end, I can pose them to Dr. Smar. Um, Dr. Smar, my next question is, you ran the only high school for girls under the Taliban regime back in 2014. Um, educational freedom is perhaps one of the most important tenets of civil liberty. Um, similar to the last question, um, and in Afghanistan in particular, can you talk about how a girl's access 
to free and fair education can serve as a catalyst toward democratization? Um, yes, Kinza, I need to, uh, to clarify this. The high school that I was running was during the first Taliban regime in 1990s. Okay. From 1996 to 1990, uh, 2001, not in 2014, because 2014 we didn't have Taliban government, although they were in some of the uh, districts, but not in the government. Uh, I believe that education is the foundation for democratization and for development of a country. If you really want to promote prosperity in a country, you need to have a quality education and a good foundation uh, for education. And that could be a reason where people will not be misused by, uh, by different uh, groups. The example I could say that uh, an educated woman will not bring so many children because they know that they can uh, make a space between the children uh, for better health of themselves and their children. And they can uh, actually help with a, a much better healthy family. So education, uh, a healthy family has a better economy. Mm -hmm. So it is related to, to education. So education educated people will not be misused by the different groups and they cannot for example in our case they can, the Taliban cannot impose their mentality and their own interpretation of Islam on educated people because the real Islam the educated one can read themselves and can understand themselves an educated woman can be a better Muslim mm -hmm. can be a better and can be a good example within the society the issue of access to education, particularly for girls or for anyone, uh, and beside it's a basic human rights. It's a whole, it's a problem of humanity. It's not only the problem of a woman or a girl in a country. It's a problem of a society. It's a problem for the human humanity and the human uh, in that country. So it is it is key to development, it's key to the democracy, it's key to, to live with, uh, in peace, for sustainable peace, uh, good quality education is a key. So that is, uh, I believe, and I think that if you really want a non-violent, a prosperous society, a good citizen of the world, education is key for that. Thank you. Um, as you know, uh, there have been several decrees in the last few months banning women's entry into public spaces and domains like parks and gyms, etc. Um, can you explain how the Taliban is able to rescind women's freedoms and how these gender specific constraints are enforced in practice? Is the codification of these statutes implemented in civil code or customary ordinances or just word of mouth? No, I think it's not part of our uh, tradition or culture. It's not uh, on the civil code. There's no, uh, in fact, Afghanistan is the only country who doesn't have uh, a constitution. So a country without constitution, without rule of law. So their own mentality is, is uh, uh, codified as a law. Uh, because uh, you can see in different provinces in the country with different attitude of that governor or the person who is in power. In some area, the, uh, the, the person who is, is the governor or leading that province, they're a little bit relaxed than the uh, Kabul, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they do afraid from educated women mainly. Mm -hmm. That's why they try to put restriction on education and more uh, restriction on education of women. And those are the, the ones who live in the city and they are educated. Mm -hmm. But in the rural area, they are not really enforce all these difficult laws. In the rural area, there is no public park. So they don't, there is no park. So they are, but they are going out on the on their, uh, land and working on the farm. Nobody bothers them. It is, all the pressure is on the educated woman because they know what is their rights. 
and they want to live differently, not really live according to the the uh, desire or the the wish of the uh, Taliban style of uh, of men. So I think it's they are they have their own interpretation. They claim that they have won the war and they defeated the most powerful power in the world and they as NATO countries or NATO um, military forces. So they uh, they think that they have they own the people's life mm -hmm. and particularly the women. And I think the, this is not the um, the problem of women. Mm -hmm. I think they have a personal weakness, their personal lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. Because the footstep of the, the the noise of the footstep will disturb them, the appearance of the, the woman disturbed them, they have to be covered with the burqa. They cannot see the face, but they forget that they are uh, personally um feeded by by women who are made from the woman's blood, I would say. Um, because they were not women they cannot I don't understand how they deal with their mothers and why their, their mothers and their wives and their daughters are not resistant against them mm -hmm. within the, their family mm -hmm. um so based on the fact that it's not officially codified in any you know fundamental text it appears that you know carrying out these uh, prohibitions and and punishing the transgressions of women is in some part on the onus of male re uh, relatives or spouses who in some sense uh, serve as a as a vigilant officer of the Taliban. I think this circumstance, um, in my interpretation, drums up the need for closer examination. Um, so my first question is, do you think that this practice of men being the eyes and the ears is strategic in its burden sharing with civil society to sort of absolve the regime of an institutionally backed violation of gender equality? Um, and if it's not deliberate in nature, do you think that the accepted cultural conventions more deeply embed those gendered politics or act as like a sustaining force to these decrees for women's rights violations in Afghanistan? Well, I think they are very clever on putting this way mm -hmm. because and to have people on their side. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a question of patriarchy and, and always they, they, even the tradition and culture, not on, only in my country, mm -hmm. but in all the other countries in relation to women or unwritten rules in, in courts mm -hmm. that made by men usually and tied by, on, on women by men in, the, in the society. So they are cleverly choose this one that they can have these men by punishing them, by being violent against those those people, they can have people on their side. But in general, I mean, you cannot really erase half of the population from <laughs> everything. So increasing poverty, all these uh, problems that we have in the, in the society, lack of education. I mean, I believe that the majority of the people in my country has psychological problems, mental problems, including ourselves, because we don't know what to say in this century, and it's not our religion. It's not our religion, mm -hmm. because uh, Islam started with Ikhra, the word Ikhra, mm -hmm. you, you understand it means read. Yeah. How can a Muslim can, can be a Muslim not to be able to read? And then uh, as the the holiest place for the Muslims is the Mecca. Mm -hmm. it, during the pilgrimage, every man and woman from all over the world, more than three million people are attending every year. They're walking around uh, around Mecca with open face. Mm -hmm. And together, nobody segregates women and men mm -hmm. in Mecca. So they think that Afghanistan is more holy than Mecca for Muslims. Mm -hmm. So this is this is their own mentality and their own interpretation. Right. And of course, they have the people on their side who doesn't understand, who cannot read and write properly, mm -hmm. and they're uneducated. 
So they're following the educated person do not believe on that kind of interpretation of Islam. Mm -hmm. And then in, in our religion, everybody ha is responsible for their own act and they will be accountable mm -hmm. themselves. Nobody is accountable for somebody's behavior mm -hmm. to be uh, to act as a, as a police of God. And um, what is the general feedback amongst men? I guess there, there perhaps isn't a fully common thread, but are they supportive and accepting of having this kind of jurisdiction over their wives, daughters, and sisters? And more specifically, what role do Afghan men play in dismantling the syst systematic curtailment of women and protecting their um, autonomy? And can they be punished for doing so? And if so, how often and when? I guess, how do you disrupt a system that, like you said, is so abstract in nature? Well, I think the people are not supporting, but the, the situation is such that they try to survive. Mm -hmm. Everybody was, I mean, the, the people were not expecting. Uh, and they claim that they are supported by the people. If they are supported by the people, why they are afraid from uh, a democratic process mm -hmm. and election? Why they are not uh, accepting the election, mm -hmm. and and so practically they are not legitimate. They they do not have legitimacy among the people because they are not elected by the people. Mm -hmm. Then they don't have legitimacy in the international community because who could? I mean, which other country you name to put public official ban on girls' education? An official ban on women's movement completely. Mm -hmm. No other country in the world. So we, we cannot be the only the only people in the in the world to to mm -hmm. act like this in this century with this uh, development of technology. Right. Um just want to give out another reminder to keep sending me DMs with questions if you have any. Um, my next question is, so public figures and women with positions in NGOs and, and rights-based organizations are under a particular threat uh, by the Taliban, but they're still able to operate in some sense. How has the nature or the efficacy of their jobs changed and, and has it necessitated any engagement for the purposes of their mission, of course, um, engagement with Taliban mullahs? If so, what sorts of compromises or concessions or changes must be made by these civil society orgs under the advisability of the Taliban? Well, the civil society role has always uh, uh, not been an easy job in Afghanistan, but uh, uh, particularly now it's not easy, but they try to adapt in uh, the survival mode and, and try to engage with the leadership of Taliban, not in the, in the capital, but also in, in the local places in order to continue their work. And the, the other uh, issue is that they really need those small support by the civil societies, if it's uh, running a health clinic or distribution of, of relief programs uh, uh, or this kind of a program which really indirectly help the Taliban because um, as long as people have access to a small amount of food or, or some kind of a survival living possibility, then it will be less resistance. Uh, because of their brutality and because of their, um, their aggression, uh, people really try to survive. It, it's, you cannot imagine that how many people left already the country, the educated one and mm -hmm. capable one. Uh, um, a kind of a brain drain in the country. Right. Uh, and anyone who has the possibility to travel outside of Afghanistan, they would do. Mm -hmm. um, absolute majority. Yes. The people. And that's not possible to, to take 35 million people out of the country. Um, if not 35, but 34 million absolutely wants to come. Let's have 1 million for the Taliban. Hmm. 
I'm hoping you could talk a bit about, based on your identity as a Hazara woman, um, if you could shed some light for the audience about the persecution of the Hazara community by the Taliban and how um, their struggle has either changed or exacerbated since the last year. Yeah, I think it is, it's not new, the persecution of the Hazaras, because they face the same problem during the first Taliban regime and during the last 20 years when the international community was there, they were killed in different ways. Uh, as a passenger, they were taken hostage and killed without any question. They, they killed the university students on the way from one province to another province. They, they killed even the children. Uh, and they had attacks, suicide attacks in the educational centers, in the wedding halls, in the sports um, clubs, you name it. And they, during the election or during the, the peoples uh, who were um, trying to participate on the election and getting their ID in the line, they were attacked. So people were really attacked. Because I think it's a, it's a part of the, unfortunately, part, again, part of the proxy war in Afghanistan between the different, the Hazaras, the majority of the Hazaras are Shias. So for them, uh, although they know we believe in the same God, we believe in the same Quran, the, mm -hmm. the book that we, uh, the Prophet and all the, um, the Khalifas and the Imams, but they, they think that they have, it's a political agenda. It's not really a question of Islam and, and the belief. So they try to, to prosecute, kill these people. And the recent attack was the, uh, on the girls where more than 56 girls were killed during the, uh, within that uh, training center uh, in September. So there is uh, prosecution against those people. Uh, um, unfortunately, not it's not new. It's um, during the history of the country. It was always, but the Taliban are the harshest and the most aggressive one in Afghanistan. And there's no no accountability, of course. They claim that they would try to find those people who commit this but so far no one has been prosecuted or brought to justice for this kind of action and they know what they uh, how they started the whole suicide attacks there. because in afghanistan when we had the ussr the people of afghanistan fought with the ussr for 10 years we never had a suicide attack mm -hmm. suicide attack in afghanistan started after 2003 after the Iraq war impact. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amir, for your question. Um, he's wondering if um, the Hazaras perhaps, are they, and the answer is surely no, are they the only uh, prominent target of the Taliban in Afghanistan? Um, or is it sort of a general crackdown on anyone verbally or vocally uh, dissenting the Taliban and um, how can can we and I mean we by international accountability mechanisms, democratic institutions, uh, civil society members, how can we support and shed light on these sort of underrepresented facets of the Taliban's Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. I think one is that the, they are against development and modernity. So it's not only the Hazaras, but the Hazaras has been targeted, from, as I said, during their first government and continue to do that. And in all the other uh, people who oppose their, um, their regime and their um, way of thinking, their behavior, are targeted in the country. So it's the people who are resisting in some part of the country, military-wise, they're being uh, badly treated. And, and that's a lot of uh, uh, 
civilian has been killed. Torture, uh, arbitrary arrest, arbitrary killing uh, is very, very common. And it was not only on those, but also on the uh, people who were in the media. I mean, the, the freedom of expression and freedom of media is really shrinking. Mm -hmm. So similar to the uh, shrinking of the uh, space for the civil society, and uh, as I said, that against the modernity and democratic um, value and principles, uh, and of course human rights, because they they do not believe on equality. Although in Islam, it's clear that every human being born with equal dignity, and they don't uh, apply that. Unfortunately, in Afghanistan. Thank you. It's a question of power in politics. Right. Control, how to control the people. Um, your incredible insight offers uh, such a distinct and, and valuable perspective, and um, perhaps the impetus for those outside of Afghanistan to activate and mobilize. What is your call to action for international entities, democratic governments, NGOs, and rights-based groups, and civil society members uh, for the purposes of Afghan women, girls, and minority groups that you've spent your whole life protecting? Yeah, I think it's uh, the Afghanistan case is a, a, is a collective failure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem in Afghanistan is will not stay within our boundary wall. Mm -hmm. So it is moral responsibility to all of us and to every human being who believe on human rights and equality. Mm -hmm. uh, because inequality and injustice in Afghanistan will be inequality for, for humanity and injustice for everyone. They learn from each other. I mean, I unfortunately, I heard somebody here in, in the, the U.S. who claimed that the um, Taliban style of mentality should be applied in this country. So it is, it is a problem because they they embolden all the um, uh, people who believe on patriarchy system, um, and it is already. In different countries, you can see the sign, and they can, unfortunately, they can um, become an example of, of uh, apartheid, I would say, mm -hmm. because apply the gender apartheid in Afghanistan, and it will be some people here are saying that that kind of style, that kind of. Uh, um, Behavior should impose in in the other countries on women, and they should be sent at home to to keep the children. Mm -hmm. And that is sad actually. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the international community, the people who believe on human rights, and human rights is not exclusively Western values. It's a human value, mm -hmm. and we have to uh, really think about it and apply and do everything to protect human rights everywhere, in every corner, not only in my country, but also in any other countries where human rights violation is, is continuing. On a um, more grassroots and individual level, um, amplifying narratives um, of underrepresented underrepresented entities is so, so important and disseminating this information is a crucial first step. Um, I'm wondering um, if you have any specific charge or, or task or, or message for those on a smaller scale, students, um, researchers, academics, civil society members, um, and how, although they don't have a specific stake in the future and trajectory of Afghanistan, it does transcend our borders. What can they do or should do and what should they be listening to? Well, I think they they have to do, um, they keep, should keep Afghanistan in the agenda. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, uh, advocate for uh, human rights in the country and also um, try to raise awareness about the situation in Afghanistan 
and the violation of human rights in the culture of impunity in Afghanistan to the other, um, to everyone. Secondly, I think uh, it's really needed to do a lot of research in relation to Afghanistan and different issues. Why and how these people become to uh, uh, to this to power in the country, and what uh, was the mistakes? We need to learn from the mistakes, because uh, as I said, that it will not stay in our boundary wall. And Afghanistan, uh, during the first Taliban regime, showed that unfortunately the country became one of the um, train camps for terrorists from all over the, the world. And that can be the same this time. And that will cause uh, a lot of problems. Although the, when the 9-11 was happening, it was a, a biggest tragedy for, for human beings, for humanity. Yeah, but then you, can, you don't find um, the people who committed the attack, none of them were Afghans. But most of them been trained in Afghanistan and had a connection with the, the people who were living in Afghanistan. So that, um, uh, hopefully, the history will not repeat itself. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it repeats itself in Afghanistan, it might repeat in the, uh, in the other part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I hope we will not pay that heavy price for it yeah. again. Mm -hmm. um before we wrap up, I want to invite everyone listening to please send in their questions. Um, and finally, Dr. Smart, um, do you have any other final call to actions or messages for all of us tuning in today? Yeah, I think one of the, the things that the people can do, uh, they have to write to, to their uh, representative in Congress, mm -hmm. woman and, and and raise the issue that they should not forget the concern. And once again, it's a it's a human disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in, in Afghanistan in this century? And first of all, as I said, that they have to read and increase their own knowledge, and then look at the impact on the other um, on the other part. And it, as I said, it's it's a moral responsibility. And we all have the responsibility to protect the human rights um, every day in race issue. And including including supporting with small scales personal mm -hmm. and to um, for education and for any other um, humanitarian relief program in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Samar, for joining me today and taking the time to share your incredible story with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm extremely sorry and apologize for the oh, second time. My gosh, that, that's okay. Um, I hope that it will it work. Yes. It was and useful for the people. Yes. Um, as a reminder, this discussion will be adapted as a podcast episode and will be released onto HRF's podcast series, Dissidents and Dictators, available on Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. If you, should, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to follow Dr. Seema Samar and the Human Rights Foundation on Twitter and Instagram. I'd like to reiterate Dr. Samar's amazing sentiments. International solidarity is important and everyone has the capacity and moral responsibility um, to be at the forefront of the pursuit towards a more peaceful, just, and free world. My name is Kenza Buenen, and this was Dissident and Dictators, a conversation series by the Human Rights Foundation. Thank you again for joining and be sure to tune in next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.